Hi, everybody. We are very excited that you've joined us this morning for our race um, and that you have supported us throughout the year as we have run all of our webinars and programming. It has been for all of us an incredibly eventful year. I don't know if anybody remembers, but about one year ago right now, all of us on our end were in a panicked tizzy hoping that our first ever virtual race would go well. And this year, in much less panic, absolutely no tizzy. We have mastered over the course of the year, the art of existing in virtual formats. And so thank you for joining us again uh, today, one year later for our second and what is planned to be the last uh, virtual stride and thrive race. We will, we will not be doing this again in the virtual format. Although for those of you who live far away, it is very nice to be able to have people join from many more states than would otherwise be able to participate some of us at home, um, some of us um, at work, some of us kind of all over the place. So thank you for joining us. We're very glad you're here. And this is also sort of the culmination of a year of webinars. So one of the things we've done this year in an adaptation for COVID is that instead of having our annual conference, um, we have had a series of webinar events in the evening that are then posted on our YouTube channel if anybody misses them and wants to um, uh, jump on and see them or finds them of varying interest depending on where they are along their treatment or cancer course. Um, we've had these webinars and then we actually started the very first webinar with a series of um, question and answers discussions amongst some of the GYN oncologists from the Kelly Gynecologic Oncology Service. And so we're going to end with a myth, bus myth buster session of talking about all the questions and things we get asked that we wonder, hmm, where did that come from? But that lots of people ask us all the time. And so um, it actually came out of a little dialogue that Dr. Fader and I and some other GYN oncologists were having about what were some of our favorite myths that we had been asked about or things we heard that made us scratch our head and go, where did that come from? And then just some fun questions. So we're very lucky tonight to have sort of some of our GYN oncologists from KGAS here. And if we sort of go around real briefly, I'll let everybody introduce themselves um, instead of me doing so. So Dr. Fader, why don't you go ahead and give us like a one-liner on you? Hi hey everyone, Amanda Fader, GYN oncologist. I'm downtown at the mothership with my wonderful colleagues here. Um, I. Love what I do. I do a lot of research in rare tumors and endometrial cancer and clinical trials, and I'm very passionate about that. And I am a wife and mother of three, an 18 year old, a 14 year old and 11 year old, and I have a high school graduate as of this Wednesday. So lots going on in my household. Very exciting. A very good year in your house for sure. Dr. Ferris, do you want to go next? Hi there, I'm Stuart Ferris. I am uh, one of the G1 oncologists uh, downtown, and I am just about to start my third year here in Baltimore. I'm super excited uh, that I've uh, integrated into the group and uh, have uh, established fast friends. Some of my, my colleagues have been already friends for years, so that was already uh, very exciting. I, I run the fellowship program, so we're helping train the next generation of G1 oncologists to do exactly what we're doing and hopefully better and um, more successful in the future. Uh, so I'm very proud of all the work that we do for that. Um, and I'm super excited to support this tonight or today. Dr. Liu, you're next. Hi everyone, my name is Fong Liu. I'm the newest member to join um, this wonderful group um, I came here from Boston and my clinical practice is based at Greater Baltimore Medical Center. I'm so happy to be a part of this group. Um, my philosophy for patient care is reading, uh, is really meeting uh, each and every woman and their family where they are, um, which I think is really reflective of the philosophy of this entire group. So love being here in Baltimore um, and look forward to, to having our discussion today. Dr. Stone. Hi, everybody. It's so good to see everybody and all of our um, colleagues. Um, I am the um, division director um, for the service and have practices both downtown and at Howard County. 
Um, and we really worked hard to develop the program at Howard County and assume probably to be expanding it, which is really exciting. Um, and I have um, a dual appointment in the Armstrong Institute, which is our Institute of Quality and Safety. Um, and I, I love that that part of my, my job and day. And in particular, I'm in charge of clinical pathways for Johns Hopkins Medicine, um, both medical and surgical. And um, in particular, as it relates to surgery, running the enhanced recovery program um, for Hopkins, which, um, you know, the goal is to make um, surgery less physically stressful for patients so that they have an easier recovery um, and uh, better outcomes. So thanks for having me. And Dr. Beavis. Hi, everyone. I'm Anna Beavis, um, one of the gynonks in the downtown campus. I've been here for in Baltimore for six years and I trained here. So a lot of the people you see here helped me become I'm the GYN oncologist I am today. And I've been in attending now for almost three years. Um, I have a large part of my work is in research, looking at preventing cervical and endometrial cancer. Um, and my patient focus is always on kind of the whole patient and a holistic approach both like what Dr. Lou said, meeting the patient where they're at and kind of understanding all of the aspects of your life outside of the cancer diagnosis and how that affects the cancer diagnosis. Yeah. Okay, so let's get into some of, our, some of our myths, some of our tricks, some of the things we hear. So I kind of broke these down into three buckets. They're the things we hear about chemo, they're the things we hear about radiation, they're the things we hear about surgery. And then there's the, there is a fourth bucket. There's sort of the miscellaneous bucket. So I guess I shouldn't say three, I should say four. There are four buckets. Although I always think about what we do as being a three bucket um, profession. So um, let's talk about chemo first. Um, what is chemo? Just a broad general question. What is chemo? I feel like people always ask this. I, I'm not sure, you know, um, what the exact answer is nowadays, because I feel like we have so many different um, medications that we can use to treat cancer. But what I always tell people is the way to think about chemo is that all chemo works, no matter what chemo you're talking about, whether it be carboplatin or Taxol or Gemzar, um, all chemo works by preventing cell division. And, um, and so cancer cells, you know, inherently have this ability to divide out of control. And so that's why chemotherapy works on cancer, because those cells are dividing disproportionate to the other normal cells in our body. I love it. And I think that then gets us into why it causes some side effects, right? So it affects chemo affects not only the cancer cells, but the other cells in our body. And I think probably one of the questions we get asked a lot is about hair loss. And am I necessarily going to lose my hair when I'm on chemo? And is there anything I can do to stop it? So do those cold caps work? Is there anything we can do to stop us from losing hair? I'm happy to address this question. Um, to build off what Becky, uh, Dr. Stone um, said, you know, I think when we give chemo, we're giving this dose, the, the highest dose we can give to fight the cancer, but the lowest dose to try and have the least amount of side effects. Um, and so it does affect your other cells. Um, so that's why we always have to watch for side effects that can really impact if it's safe to give you chemo or not. So losing your hair can be very psychologically um, affecting but is not dangerous as far as, you know, it's not dangerous to give you another dose of chemo if your hair has fallen out but it is one of the number one concerns of our patients um, and with good reason. So to answer the first question, will your hair always fall out with chemo? It depends on the specific chemo. Um, we give a lot of Taxol and Taxanes and that class of medicine essentially will always cause hair loss. Um, most of our other medicines might thin your hair, but by and large, most of the time it's the Taxol or the Taxane that is the culprit. Uh, the cold caps is a great question. Um, I have, over the last year, changed my tune slightly on this. Um, the data would suggest that 50% of people or women who use the cold cap, which is basically an ice cap for your head during chemo, which you can imagine is quite uncomfortable, 
um, it basically decreases the blood flow to your hair follicles. And the idea is then that less chemo gets to your hair follicles, your hair falls out less. So the data suggests that 50% of women see um, about 50% less hair loss, which when I first heard that statistic, I said, well, if 50% of my hair is going to fall out, that doesn't really, <laughs> it doesn't really help me. It's the same as 100%. But I have seen some um, very successful cases um, with it, just a few over the last year. And so I think it's something worth talking to your doctor about. Um, and it's also worth early talking to your doctor about alternatives to that, such as wigs um, uh, and hats and things like that. So what about the other big side effect we get asked about? Everybody's going to get nauseous and everybody's going to vomit and everybody's going to be hanging over the toilet, just like the scenes in the movies, right? Yeah, I think this is a really common question and concern. And, um, you know, as with a lot of myths, there's always just a little bit of truth to it, right? So we know these medicines can cause side effects and nausea is a very common side effect of almost every chemo medicine we have. But the truth is that very few patients experience vomiting directly related to their chemo. And the reason that is, is we have a program in place to give medicine to help prevent that from happening. And that medicine is given during, right before you get your chemotherapy. And, and in some cases, depending on which medicine, which chemotherapy drug you're getting, you're gonna take medicines after chemotherapy to help prevent that vomiting from happening. So I tell patients frequently, some nausea is expected, vomiting should be almost never. Um, and if that were the case, we need to know because we might be able to make some adjustments to these medicines to actually address and fix the symptoms. So don't assume, oh, I'm getting chemo, I have to have nausea, I have to have vomiting. That's not necessarily true. So always let us know what's going on and we can customize the plan to you. I think there's also, to dovetail on Dr. Ferris, there's also a, um, an assumption or myth that people who go on chemotherapy may lose a lot of weight and become quite malnourished. And there's all different types of chemotherapy, but certainly with most of the treatment regimens we use in gynecologic oncology, and because of these um, pretty contemporary um, anti-nausea medicines and the ability to give hydration and steroids and other things to help people feel good, most people don't end up losing weight or only very little. In fact, some people might gain a pound or two. Um, and are able to maintain a decent, you know, nutritional level. Um, I think a lot of folks also ask about, you know, I don't know if you were going to ask this, Dr. Weathington, but about nutrition and, you know, what diets, what are the magic diets to use during cancer treatment? And I, I will say there's no magic bullet. What I always tell my patients is that the Mediterranean diets and American Cancer Society diets are really quite excellent in being low in animal and saturated fats but well balanced with fruits, vegetables, grains, and proteins. Um, and it's, it's so critical to not go on any drastic diets um, during chemotherapy because maintaining nutrition is vital to help to maintain your health and your immune system um, function um, during, uh, during this challenging part of treatment. And so not making any drastic changes um, and certainly asking us if you have any questions about dietary changes you want to make, um, certainly we're here to help in any way or to refer you to one of our cancer center nutritionists. Except there's one thing that everybody has to do, right? We have to cut out sugar. You cannot take in one single granule of sugar, right? That's definitely a rule. It's definitely a truth and not a myth, right? We get this all the time. Uh, I feel like more and more each year. I, I tell everybody that, you know, sugar is a necessary component to our diet. Anything in excess in our diet is not going to be good. Um, and so I think just like Dr. Fader was saying, no extremes in, in, your, in your dietary plan, right? So if you're going to go low sugar and really focus on protein, high quality proteins and and some uh, healthy fats, no problem. But to be militantly zero sugar 
um, it's probably going to make you pretty miserable. Um, there are parts of our body that actually require sugars and our body can actually manufacture those sugars. And so just even if you were to try to cut out every single sugar from your diet, your body's going to make it anyway. Um, so I think that knowing that information sort of allows you to release yourself from the restriction a little bit, uh, enjoy your life, enjoy your family. Food is often a very big part of our cultures um, and just do so in moderation. And I think, and, and not worry so much about feeding the cancer because unfortunately we don't know of a way to starve the cancer. Um, that we're working on things that attack cancer in different ways and new and creative ways, but really getting at that metabolic sort of, you know, control of the cancer is not something we fully understand. And I am quite certain that there is some information out there where people will promise certain outcomes uh, based on restrictive diets. Um, we have just not seen any significant data to support that. So I really encourage everyone to be common sense, healthy diet. I love the Mediterranean diet idea. I think it's personally think that's a great approach. I have a few patients who also look at um, mostly a plant-based diet. And I think that's also a very good choice for some people. You have to be careful about getting enough protein uh, with that type of diet, but it is possible. And we have nutritionists in the cancer center who are more than happy to talk with you. And I'll just put a plug in for our nutrition webinar, which is on the YouTube website. Um, and we definitely discuss those two diets specifically as being, you know, the plant-based diet plus lean proteins and the Mediterranean diet are excellent, uh, very healthy diets. Yeah. Now, are there, are there actually any forbidden, you know, all, all joking about my sugar question. I mean, I meant it as a serious question, but I clearly posed it in a slightly joking way, but are there foods that you really shouldn't eat during chemo because they're more likely to carry germs like sushi or raw fruits and vegetables? And how do you know whether or not you can eat those things when you're on, on treatment? Silence. The silence for those of you who are listening is because this is hotly debated and discussed. And it probably has a it, it probably has a it depends answer. So if anybody wants to hedge an answer, I'll take it. Uh, I'll 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 jump in. <laughs> I just said unpasteurized milk. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think it depends. Um, so I'm going to hedge, right? So I'm, I think it depends. What was your diet before? right? Because if this is something that was already a regular part of your diet, it is unlikely, unless you are going to become significantly immunocompromised and not everybody on chemo is, but some people do become that. And we will let you know if that is your case. Um, but if something was already a regular part of your diet, I don't see how continuing that practice is going to change your risk. Um, as long as we're letting you know that your immune system is working well. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that's come up is not so much food related, but as we've begun to learn more about immunotherapy and in sort of what context immunotherapy works maybe better, um, some of the new data around, you know, um, sort of the effectiveness of immunotherapy and in, um, in when it's administered in patients who are taking antibiotics or in people who are maybe on steroids. And I sort of like all, I think that research is really interesting. The idea that maybe being on chronic antibiotics or chronic steroids might um, negatively impact the, the effectiveness of immune therapy, because I think it's it fundamentally tells us, you know, we, didn't, we had, had never really appreciated how much of our immune system is in our GI tract. I really think, you know, we're finally coming to really appreciate the fact that our, our GI tract, our, small, our stomach, small intestine, large intestine, may be one of the biggest functional components of our immune system. And, and it, it also then always makes me think whenever I'm talking to patients about food and what they eat, something that, that 
I feel like I've learned as I've aged is how much food is medicine. And, and it really is um, a, an important part of, of feeling well and it, even how, how we sleep or how well we sleep, our energy levels. Um, and um, if, you, if you only eat junk food all the time, you're just not going to feel well. Um, and, and so eating um, healthy foods, um, you know, well-balanced diet, uh, I think is just part of also just, just feeling good and having good energy level and being able to sleep well. That was really well said, and I don't have anything more to add there, but I would say just as Dr. Ferris said, you know, common sense guidelines when it comes to foods, um, uh, the chemotherapy ha does have an effect on rapidly dividing cells like your gut, your stomach, and so it can be a little more unsettled than usual, um, both because of the effects in the gut itself and the effect that it has in a center called the nausea or vomiting center in your brain. And so sometimes smells are, and tastes are different uh, during chemotherapy and that can affect the kind of foods you want to eat or, or like, and maybe your favorite food is no longer your favorite, um, but really common sense principles, like don't eat a lot of undercooked foods, like maybe steak tartare is something you should be careful with because there's a higher risk of food poisoning and your gut is a little bit more unsettled and, um, and uh, you know, again, prone to, pr prone to issues during chemotherapy. What about a glass of wine? What do you tell people who are getting chemo and want, their, want, want a glass of wine or a glass of champagne at a party or? Enjoy in moderation. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I say the same thing. Um, which leads us into parties and crowds and people. And I think there's a lot of myths and rumors around what you can and cannot do with regards to other people when you're getting chemo. So a lot of our patients are older and have grandkids. And so I feel like a common question I get is, can I be around my grandkids? Um, and so what do you tell people when they ask that question? Can I, you know, I, I can't be around my grandkids because they're little germ, they're little germ, germ fomites. Um, what do you, what do you say when people say that? I'm happy to answer this. I think it is kind of, I think there's a theme that's developing in a lot of our answers. Um, and it's, it's true. It's, you have to balance kind of things that really bring you a lot of joy um, and, and, you know, being around your grandchildren and your family, especially during this time is so very important. Um, it is true that as Dr. Ferris and, and others have mentioned earlier that um, there may be times where you are more immune compromised. Um, and that's, you know, that's the purpose of us checking blood counts while you're on chemotherapy. And so one of the types of cells that are normally rapidly dividing that chemotherapy can affect are the cells actually in your bone marrow um, or the cells that your bone marrow makes. And um, one of those cells are your white blood cells. And so those help us, you know, defend against infection. And so um, usually at certain points, we get a sense of how low that is. And if it does dip down low, then we may, you know, we'll be giving you a call and letting you know, you know, to make sure that you do eat um, all of your food thoroughly cooked to really make sure to practice a lot of the things that have been talked about during the COVID pandemic, you know, washing your hands. So, you know, all of us are um, so used to wearing masks now. Um, and so I, I think, you know, within those kind of common sense parameters, listening to, you know, your providers um, when they, you know, let you know outside of that, really just enjoy the time with your family. Yeah, I agree, well said. So the, the converse, Dr. Fader had to pop off. So I'm gonna apologize for her that she had to pop off. But I started by saying this, part of this session sort of arose out of a conversation that Dr. Fader and I and other GYN oncologists were having. And the question that got posed as the start of that conversation that we were having actually came from a patient of mine who was about to start on a chemo regimen after having been off for a little bit. And she said to me, 
I got to ask you a question. It was one of, I call it a door handle question. I was on the way out the door and she's like, I have to ask you one more question. I was like, yes. She goes, if I'm going back on chemo, does it mean I have to stop kissing my husband again? And I stopped and I have to admit this, had this happened to me quite recently, actually. And I've never been asked that question in my, you know, however many years now it is, 11 years of answering these questions. Um, I'd never been asked that question. And so I was taken aback and I sort of walked back in the room and sat back down and said, why are you asking? And I learned that it's a common myth that you shouldn't around the time of chemo. Some people I've learned since say 24 hours, some 48, some 72, some say it all while you're on treatment, you should not kiss your partner. You should not have sex, all those things that, you know, people like to do. So what do you tell your patients when they ask about kissing or sex or other things, private things? <laughs> I tell patients to um, worry less, love more, essentially. I mean, that's the short version of it. Um, I think that the truth is that the any tiny concentration of treat of medicine that may still be in your system um, is not a threat uh, to anyone uh, around you that can be transmitted through saliva or through uh, intimate uh, relationships. So I think that, um, yeah, worry less, love more. And I think that applies to radiation too. I, I've gotten that question before about radiation um, once from a patient who similarly, you know, didn't feel that they should be around their grandkids while they were receiving radiation because of this fear that they would emit, um, you know, protons or photons or some radioactive particles, um, which isn't true. Um, you're not radioactive and, and you can be around other people and be very close to other people. Yeah. I say the same thing. I think the other um, thing on a similar vein, which I think is probably something you were going to ask about was um, having a dedicated toilet to the person on chemo. Um, this came up with a patient of mine recently who only had one toilet in the house and she didn't know where she was going to go to the bathroom. <laughs> And I said, you're going to go in the same toilet as the rest of your household does. There's no issue there. So that was an interesting myth I hadn't heard before. Huh. Yeah. You know, I think some of this comes from other types of cancers that get treated with different types of radiation, right? Our patients with gynecologic cancer are not radioactive, but there are patients who do get treatments mm. for like thyroid cancers and things. And they can actually secrete that uh, radioactive substance in their secretions. And they are suggested to, you know, use a separate toilet for so many days and not be around children. So there's like this line of truth in it. But for our patients, that's not the case at all. Yeah, I think that's a great distinction. I think that is where a lot of these myths come from is other mm -hmm. cancers and other settings and that subtlety of situation, like even the food things, the sushi and the fresh vegetables, somebody said it, right? If it's part of your daily diet before you um, entered into cancer treatment, then your body is accustomed to it. And it's, it's one thing. And if, you know, introducing it anew, or if you're particularly neutropenic, that's our fancy word for have low blood counts and at risk of infection, um, those are settings where it sort of changes things. So it's, I think Dr. Ferris's point is right. All of this has a is, is true in some settings and it's just about the correct applicability, except for the kissing part. Well, I guess it's thyroid cancer, maybe that is true. So I shouldn't even say that. All of it is true, I guess, in, in, in some situations. Um, what about things like swimming in a lake? Have you guys ever heard that one? Can I swim in a lake while I'm on treatment? I tend to get this one around surgery. Um, and when patients have surgical incisions on their abdomen, and I tend to tell patients that, um, you know, a clean, well-kept pool is probably the safest thing. Um, and then either the ocean or a lake, um, but those would be my least favorite options um, if you're going to get in water. Um, but 
I tend tend to suggest at least two weeks or, or more after surgery. It just sort of depends on the situation. But um, I think from a chemo point of view, I think it's sort of this, my answer is gonna sound very similar to some of my previous answers, right? It kind of depends, right? How well you are in the beginning, how used, uh, if your body is used to swimming in a lake, it's something you do frequently um, and you know that that water quality is, is uh, satisfactory, then I think, you know, that is totally fine. If this is like the once in a lifetime trip uh, and you're doing this and, and you've never done it before, it's probably a good question to ask us so we can maybe give you a really focused, personalized answer. Um, we mentioned grandkids and family. What about work? Can you work during chemo treatments or what about work during radiation treatments? Or does uh, do these therapies preclude being able to go to work? So I'm happy to answer this one. I always talk to people about how they feel about their work first, because we definitely have patients who feel much better if they can work. Mm -hmm. um, and we definitely have patients who feel much better if they don't have to think about work while undergoing these treatments. So it's the same thing with surgery. Some of our patients are on the laptop day one, right? Doing emails or whatever it is. And some of our patients want to take that six weeks to, to recuperate. Um, I think there's a lot of both physical and psychological side effects from the treatments and the surgeries that we do. Uh, and so, yes, you can work, but whether you want to or not, or in what capacity is something I like to have a, a very personalized conversation about. And one that almost every patient will kind of bring up. Um, and for some of them, they want to, and some of them, they don't. And either way, it's fine. Yeah, I love that, Anna. I think it's really individualized. And I think that it also depends upon um, people's like prior experience. Mm -hmm. If they had chemo before and they worked, you know, while while they were receiving chemotherapy and they found that to be a source a source of joy or distraction or meaning, um, or if they didn't work and they found that to sort of be helpful to get through treatment. But I also think it depends on you know where people are at, you know, during their their block of treatment, and it, especially for a patient who's starting out newly on chemo. Um, cause it's such an unknown. I often will say, um, you know, if you can, you know, take the first cycle and just see what it's like and just take, you know, plan to take off, um, for that week or three weeks or what have you, until you sort of have a sense, um, for what that's like. And that sort of tends to, I feel like to put the patient more in control of the situation. Um, and also can start a dialogue like with their coworkers or, or, um, you know, folks at work um, in terms of potentially like what they're going through and, and expand their support system if, if um, you know, people are able to do that. But then also, I also caution people that oftentimes, you know, at the beginning of treatment, they may, they may feel okay, they have energy and, um, you know, they're doing a lot, but that not to get discouraged if, you know, once they've gotten, you know, to cycle four of chemo or to sort of the late couple of weeks during radiation that they may run out of steam and find that they can only work a half a day or maybe instead of working every day, working one or two days a week or not at all. And, and so that it, it changes as somebody sort of progresses through treatment. Mm -hmm. I also think for that reason, sometimes radiation is actually a little harder to work through than chemotherapy because the radiation is every single day. So for many people, not for everybody, but for a lot of people, radiation is Monday, Monday through Friday, five days a week for five weeks. That's sort of our common theme for radiation treatment sequencing. And I think for some jobs, that's just very challenging. And then to your point, Dr. Stone, it is radiation tends to be more cumulative. So I think that variation over the course of treatment is definitely very, very true. I agree. I think I think another place where this question may come in is also tied into the question about, are you just sick, you know, over the toilet bowl the whole time? Um, and I think a conversation that I often have with patients is that, you know, like as it has been mentioned before, you know, not all chemotherapy is the same. There's so many different types of medications or chemotherapy, chemotherapy drugs um, that the most 
Um, it certainly depends on the, the actual chemotherapy drug that you're getting. Um, but for the most common, the carboplatin and the paclitaxel that we give for you know, most of our patients, as Dr. Ferris had mentioned before, yes, nausea may be an issue, but there are so many things that we could use medication-wise um, that can help um, control that. So I think a lot of patients end up being pleasantly surprised that, wow, I'm not, you know, stuck in the bathroom and, you know, just vomiting and um, better than they, they thought. I think we've talked a lot about the side effects. And I think one of the common questions or one of the common statements, it's not even so much a question, although it is kind of a question of statements is, I don't want that chemotherapy. I don't want all those side effects. I only want immunotherapy. And that's a myth for a couple of reasons. Um, but when people come in and sort of say, I don't want that chemotherapy, that's the old way of doing it. There are all those side effects. People are miserable. That's not what I'm interested in. I only want immunotherapy. How do you sort of address that question? And what would you, how would you answer that? Well, I usually ask patients sort of what they know about immunotherapy and uh, like, you know, what, what is bringing this up? And for a lot of people, at least lately, the, the answer is some version of, well, someone in my family told me to ask this, right? Or I saw this commercial and they told me that stage four cancers, right? I have this new hope and it's immunotherapy. And so I sort of figure out kind of where they're coming from to try to answer the question because yes, immunotherapy is, can be amazing for some patients in very specific situations. It's not broadly used. And in gynecologic cancers, it's not our first choice yet, um, but there's always evident, uh, studies that are ongoing. And so if it's something you're really interested in, talk with us to see if there's a clinical trial you'd be eligible for because I think that uh, that would be a great way to see if you could get access to that medicine. Another one of the myths is once I've had treatment, I can never have children again. If you're young, right? Most of our patients are older, but some of our patients are younger. And so I think one of the myths definitely is that cancer treatment precludes the possibility of future fertility. So, um, and sometimes patients don't even ask that question, but then sometimes we do get asked that question. So what are the ways in which we talk about fertility with, our, with younger patients? And what are some of the common fertility myths that we wanna dispel? I think one of the things that comes up a lot is, um, just even just reviewing sort of basic anatomy and function of the gynecologic system. I mean, I, I always tell patients, you know, I spend every minute of every day thinking about, you know, the function of, of um, the gynecology system. And, but for most people, you know, most people haven't thought about, you know, what the GYN anatomy or function is, you know, maybe since like health class in high school or, you know, a course they took in college or for some reason. And so I do find like it's really helpful to have sort of like when we start a discussion about cancer treatment, um, you know, whether it be surgery or surgery and chemo or radiation or whatever is, is with patients and their spouse or children or, or, you know, whoever's there, just a review of the anatomy and function. Because I think that um, most people you know, just have forgotten that, that the ovary is really the, you know, functional part of the female anatomy in terms of, you know, what makes eggs, what makes female hormones. And I think this discussion has come up, you know, um, a lot as we've realized that ovarian function continues past when a woman stops having her period. And so, you know, we used to take out people's ovaries all the time um, when they were young, if they were, you know, perimenopausal or they had stopped having their period the year before. But now as we've gained this new appreciation for the fact that the ovaries have, 
you know, um, function that contribute to our overall health, um, we certainly give that a lot of consideration and pause. Um, and, and I think in this day and age of assisted, what we call ART or assisted reproductive technology, there are so many innovative ways um, that we can help to preserve fertility um, and help a couple um, have or, or um, create a family, um, even despite cancer treatment. And it, it, a lot of these discussions and you know our, our compassion for patients going through this and their families is what inspired you know the creation of our um, fertility preservation and innovation center this past year, because we really didn't have a resource at Hopkins where patients could go and you know um, submit queries or request appointments um, in efficient ways. And I, I feel like this is not just a you know a major major issue faced by our patients in G1 oncology, but all young women um, who have a new cancer diagnosis um, and are um, having conversations with their providers about treatment, but also now this newer group of patients that we have started to identify through genetic testing, which is sort of this population of previvors, right, which are patients who have a, a gene mutation predisposing them to a risk of gynecologic cancer. And, um, and what to do in that situation um, in terms of, um, in particular, risk-reducing GYN surgery. And so I think that that, that um, resource of counseling is really vital for that patient population as well. Um, and, and just by Googling Johns Hopkins Fertility, you can easily find that, that website and um, immediately get in touch with us. I think that's right. I think the key there being there are lots of ways to, to create a family. And so it's about starting the dialogue and moving that, moving that dialogue forward is a really important language. You mentioned family. I think one of the myths is nobody in my family has cancer, so I can't get cancer. Um, in GYN cancers, true or false? False. False. There well, that's a pretty bold statement. So that's why it's false. Um, <laughs> now, the converse is true. Just because someone in your family has cancer doesn't necessarily mean you're at higher risk. It all depends on the type of cancer, who had the cancer, what type, what age. Um, but in general, if nobody in your family has had cancer, that doesn't mean that you can't get it. You know, Some of our cancers are caused by a virus like cervical cancer. Um, and that's not inherited. And our other cancers that we treat are um, majority not inherited, even though ovary cancer is associated with gene mutations um, like BRCA or BRCA, which people have probably heard of, um, and endometrial cancer as well may be associated with gene mutations. The majority of the cases just occurs, um, what we say sporadically or without a genetic hereditary reason, um, and usually there's a host of risk factors that we could evaluate, but mostly age is our predominant risk factor for cancer. The longer you live, the more likely it is you'll develop something, um, which is also why it's important to know all the signs and symptoms of our gynecologic cancers, which I know we have a resource for as well. That is very true, we do. So is it contagious cancer? Like can my spouse or my partner get it from me or a family member or a friend, can I give it to somebody? That's easier, no, <laughs> period. Yeah. Even those cancers that are associated with the virus, the cancer is not contagious even though the, the virus may be, which I think is a common myth now that's come up with HPV in particular, I think. And you mentioned HPV, which, which hence led me to that, led me to that question. Um, I think uh, one, another myth I get, we mentioned the younger women in fertility. Now let's go to the other extreme. My, you know, our lovely women who are in their late eighties or early nineties and come to us and say, I'm too old to get treatment. Is, is there an age that's too old? Where you would probably say- Probably not. Women? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, probably not. Um, I think it's highly individual. 
Um, and this is what we, what we always talk about as physicians is a shared decision, right? We partner with patients, we customize a plan to their specific situation. Um, and so I don't, I don't think we make hard rules when it comes to age and treating cancer. Now, there are limits to everything that we do. And I think that's where we had that dialogue with each patient. And I, I think in that setting, um, I always want to understand from the patient's point of view, why they think they're too old, you know? And then, because part of that conversation is really for us to explain what all is involved. Um, and I think once there's an understanding, I think there, there's, uh, it becomes more clear kind of, oh, that actually doesn't sound as bad as maybe I thought. Or, you know what, that piece sounds okay to me, but that other piece doesn't sound okay. Um, and I think that's what is, uh, is so important um, about, you know, these consultations and these visits with us is so that we could understand and we can explain and you can explain um, and so that you can understand. Okay, last myth, the one that always gives me a moment of pause and gets a little knot in my stomach that I feel that we should dispel without a doubt. What did I do to cause this? Right? I must have done something to cause my cancer. I think for me as a, as a physician, that's always the hardest myth to hear somebody say, especially for our cancers. Um, so what do you say when somebody says, what did I do to cause my cancer? Or I must have done something to cause my cancer. Well, I think um, kind of going back to the, you know, my nobody in my family had this and and therefore I shouldn't have it. Um, it kind of follows in that conversation sometimes for me with patients. Um, because what I end up telling patients is that, you know, most of the time it is, it's explained by nothing more than bad luck almost. There's nothing that you did do or didn't do um, that caused this. And, and um, to really, um, that, yeah, that's, that's really kind of the message that I try to get across. I think it's tricky because um, from an epidemiologic research standpoint, we're always looking for risk factors, um, but risk factors shouldn't become kind of points of blame. Um, I was asked during a podcast once about, you know, a lower risk of ovary cancer for someone who's had children versus someone who's never had children. And should people have kids to prevent cancer? Um, I don't recommend it. <laughs> But it's, it's an example of how we kind of take this big data and, and use it um, in a way that is not useful. Um, and so if there are, is there anything, if there's anything about your lifestyle, for example, obesity does increase the risk of some cancers. Um, and our job is to help you treat, um, treat those cancers. And if we then know that there's any, any of that might impact your life down the line, we're going to help counsel and recommend changes like to diet and things like that for you. But I think it's important to know that in, in general, no one's done anything specific to cause their cancer. And there's maybe a whole host of things that you could try and place blame on, but bad luck's probably number one. And I often tell patients and if any of my patients are listen, listening to this, I'm sure I like all of them have heard me say this because I feel like um, people worry about this a lot. And, you know, the fact of the matter is, is that cancer is one of the things that defines us as human beings, right? You know, we, we won't live forever. Um, and, and as Anna pointed out, or Dr. Beavis pointed out, you know, age is probably the number one risk factor. And as we age, you know, we um, accumulate in increasing risk for development of cancer. Um, and, you know, there was once a study that was done where um, they did autopsies on people who died 
from a cause other than cancer um, who are over the age of 70, like, you know, from a motor vehicle accident or a heart attack or what have you. And some astounding percentage of people actually have cancer. We just don't know about it. Um, and so it just happens, you know, when we're sitting with a patient in clinic, we just, you know, for what is mostly obvious reasons, and, and in these cases, we know about their cancer and we have the opportunity to treat it. But, um, but many, many, many of us live with, with cancers, um, you know, during our lifetime and, and particularly as we get older. Um, and then the other thing I tell people, and this is by, in no means to, you know, minimize um, the experience um, and tragedy um, that, that people face when they have cancer, but that, you know, in my opinion, cancer comes in many different forms. Um, you know, sometimes it is actually cancer that we have to get treatment for, but there are other types of cancer. There are addictions and there are other end-stage medical conditions um, that are just as life-threatening, sometimes even more life-threatening. Um, there are, you know, very, very severe depression um, and loneliness. And to me, all of those, you know, they have health effects that can be equivalent to or are worse than cancer. And, you know, our job is to, as humans, to, um, to be there for each other and to help um, to help everybody live with their cancer um, instead of, um, you know, their, or to force their cancer rather to live with them instead of, you know, living with, with cancer. Yeah. I think that's part of why we call the race the stride and thrive because it's about getting your thrive on and finding your way to, to thrive in a world that's uncertain and with treatments that are uncertain. And fortunately, um, I love looking at the statistics every year when they see when we see the number of cancer survivors and the number is going up and up and up and up. And so there's 17 million people is the current number that we quote for this year who are um, living with or survive survivors um, who are no longer in treatment and no longer have, but have moved past their cancer therapies. And so um, we are glad everybody joined us today for the race. Um, we hope you will stick around for closing ceremonies and for some awards. And we hope probably most importantly, that over the course of the day, the pieces of information that you learned, as Dr. Beavis noted, the signs and symptoms of GYN cancers, the importance of knowing your family history um, so that you can be proactive if you are at um, a genetic risk or maybe and just, just don't know yet. Um, and passing the word on to your friends and family who may not have um, known about gynecologic cancers or their risk factors or their symptoms so that they can be more aware of history and of, of their bodies and seek help when they need it. Um, so we hope today raised your awareness a little bit about gynecologic cancers. For those of you who are undergoing therapy or treatments, a few of the myths. For those of you who are done, maybe retroactively learned about some of the things you wish you had known um, before, but thank you for joining us and we'll see you back for the closing ceremonies um, at one and then at two for the awards. So have a good rest of your day.